Cortine tells told be a Dubliner. Be Torloch on me. Story number 12. Shanghai aboard the Vasa. My father was in Sweden in 1964. And when he came back, he told me about the Vasa. He'd gone on a trip as a union representative to see new methods of organising offices in different countries. It was unheard of for anyone to go anywhere in them days, except to emigrate. We accompanied him to the airport. I don't know if I'd ever been in Dublin airport. We went to the restaurant upstairs and had a last cup of tea with him after he had checked in for his flight. The place was almost deserted. But after a while, an American came in and sat down at a table. He said to the waiter in a loud voice, Can you give me a quick steak? I got a flight in half an hour. This seemed to me amazing. A man like this seemed to belong to another world. At any rate, me father got on his flight and we watched the two engines of being a plane move on down the runway and take off. First I went to Brussels and saw offices in Belgium. Then the flew on to Denmark and saw places there. Their longest stay was in Sweden, finally. When they returned, me father brought home samples of Scandinavian design. I remember elegant candlesticks and candles from Copenhagen that adorned our table. I remember, too, a brass coat of arms with the three crowns of Sweden and crossed swords under them. It sat on the wall for years after. But I haven't forgotten all the strange things he described in the stories he had to tell. He came back with talk of smorgasbord and aquavit, things we'd never heard of, policemen who wore swords, Gamlestan, the old town of Stockholm, and the Vasa in its new museum. Now, the Vasa was a royal Swedish ship, built in the year 1628 on the orders of Gustavus Adolphus Vasa, the Lion of the North, as they called him. It was built while he was away in Germany, fighting for the Protestant side in the Thirty Years' War. But with the king not being around to keep an eye on things, they don't seem to have done a very good job on the new ship, for there was a serious fault in her. She was a fine ship, every bit the match for a Spanish galleon as far as appearance and armament went anyway. One fine day she was launched from the dock at the Tre Kroner Royal Castle. The captain was Zuffring Hansen Jute, and his second in command was Lieutenant Petter Geertsen. The ship set sail on her way out of Stockholm Harbour to the cheers of the crowd, reached the mouth of the harbour, toppled over and sank. It all happened too suddenly for the crew to do anything to right the ship. Them that could jumped in the water and swam to shore. When the king heard about this, he was fit to be tied. As well he might. He told them to set up a commission and find out who was to blame. In the end, they couldn't fix the blame on anybody in particular. And the king had other things on his mind, and he in Germany in the thick of a war. At any rate, the ship had sunk to the bottom of the harbour, and there it lay, more or less intact. The hull was there, the masts and the sails, the brass cannon peeping out through their holes in the side, the supplies of wine for the captain, the gold coins to buy and sell with, and what have you. It was all there, but fathoms under water. Stories grew up about the sunken ship. Everybody knew it was down there somewhere beneath the waters. 
People soon said that they had seen it rise out of the waters in the middle of the night. The belief grew up that whenever the Swedish royal house was in danger, the Vasa would rise from the depths of Stockholm Harbour and put a delegation ashore in a boat to advise the king or queen on what to do. They'd sit up with him or her all night, but then they'd hurriedly depart, saying they had to be back be dawn and the ship back down on the seabed. For the Swedish state did have its ups and downs. Gustavus Adolphus died from his wounds fighting in a battle in Germany, and he was succeeded on the throne by his only daughter, Christina. She was a very accomplished young woman, well-educated, and also good at riding and shooting, but she was more interested in learning and philosophy than anything else, and she had no desire to marry. She seemed to be very restless. This was understandable, for she knew from books and visitors and correspondence of all the things that were going on at the royal courts and in the bustling cities of Europe to the south of them, and she yearned to take an active part in all that. Yet here she was in her icy palace in Stockholm, with nothing around her but snow and darkness for half the year. There was talk that she might bolt and just leave the Swedes to their own devices. It was on this occasion that she first experienced the clandestine support from the Vasa. Everyone remembered the sunken ship. Various attempts had been made to raise it, but for some reason they'd all failed. But information about the Queen's restless state of mind had somehow reached them in the depths of the chilly harbour. Hansen was still alive, of all the officers, and it was rumoured that he had developed supernatural powers. And so he and the dead raised the ship one night, and a boat was put ashore in the direction of the royal palace. The ship's delegation, wiping themselves dry, knocked at the castle gate. Captain and crew of the royal ship Vasa, to see the Queen on a matter of pressing importance to the kingdom, they told the dumbfounded royal pages who answered. The pages stole away and roused the Queen. As she was a very early riser, she was keen on going to bed early. But she dressed hurriedly again and met them in a private reception room. They introduced themselves. Captain Suffering Hansen, Lieutenant Peter Gildsen, and their skipper, boatswain and crew members. Madam, the captain told her, we have heard how you are eager to pursue learning and how you chafe at the restrictions of living here in Stockholm. Is this not so? It is, she said. Well, we have a solution to propose to you. What is it? I would be glad to hear of any solution. The chiefest philosopher of Europe is living in Amsterdam. It is Monsieur René Descartes. He is a Frenchman, but due to the quarrels and controversies he has had to put up with in Paris, he chose to go and live in Amsterdam. There he is in exile. The only reason he likes to be there is because Amsterdam is a busy port and no one notices him, so he can live and work as he likes with no one bothering him. The point, madam, is that he is free. He doesn't miss France, and there is nothing to keep him in Amsterdam. You could invite him here. You could ask him to be your royal preceptor, and to give you philosophy lessons in person. Through you, and with this position of honour at court, he could have an effect on this whole kingdom. He could transform it into a philosophic state and a paradise of learning and the credit would be yours. Christina had listened eagerly, but now she said, This is all very well, but how would I get him to come here? Why should he come for me? Well, you are a queen, the queen of the north. Your fame has spread in Europe despite your youth. And you speak French, don't you? Of course. Then you can easily be pupil and teacher. But of course, he has to move here. 
How can we persuade him to do that? Well, you can write him a long, flattering epistle. You are already good at that. Draw him into a philosophical correspondence. And there is something else. We happen to know that the ambassador of the French king here, Monsieur Pierre Chanu, whom you know, is a friend of René Descartes. If anyone can persuade him to come to Stockholm, he can. That is a wonderful idea, Christina said. I will write to him tomorrow. Then we will talk to Ambassador Chanu. He is an obliging, charming man, and I think I should be able to win him over for my project. The captain and crew rose. Then, madam, said the captain, we will be off for the present. Where are you going? she asked in bewilderment. Not far, said the captain. We will be out in Stockholm Harbour, but on the seabed. God bless you, she said with a shudder. We are always at your service, as we were at the service of your royal father of blessed memory. We have come back from the world of the dead to serve his daughter. You have only to call us, only to need us, and we will come. Always at midnight, though, for so it must be. And no man must know of our secret, only ourselves and our sovereign. She nodded. When you need to fetch Monsieur Descartes, we will be at your disposal. And so they left the palace. They got into their long boat and disappeared in the mists. There was a flattered an exchange of correspondence between the philosopher in Amsterdam and the Queen, arranged by Pierre Chanu and his brother-in-law, Claire Cellier, another friend of Descartes, who was also in Stockholm at the time. Pierre Chanu soon heard from Christina again. She wanted to invite Descartes to Stockholm to be her preceptor and also to found a scientific academy in Sweden. Chanu and Clercelier corresponded with Descartes, urging him to take up this opportunity. Captain Hansen was living in Stockholm still. Christina let it be known that she wanted the services of the Versa. One night the captain and crew came ashore again to the Tre Kroner castle. Gentlemen, Christina told them, I have invited Monsieur Descartes to come to Stockholm. Ambassador Chanu and resident Clercelier have also written to him to this effect. I want you to sail under cover of darkness to Amsterdam, get him aboard and bring him back here. Two nights later, the Vasa sailed at midnight on the ebb tide. In its short life above water, the ship had been disastrously top-heavy but now it had righted itself, for the captain had ordered repairs and they had been worked on be shadowy figures deep in Stockholm Harbour, and when they were ready, they sailed out into the Baltic and southwards. They passed the Straits before Copenhagen, sailed through the Kattegat and the Skagerrak, and set their course through the North Sea for Holland. A few days later, the docked in Amsterdam. Hansen and Geertsen went to see Descartes in his lodgings near the port. He was well informed about the whole project, and he had the Queen's letter and more letters from Chanu and Clercelier before him. The Navy men took him down to see their ship at the dock. He actually toured the upper deck and had a drink of aquavit with them in the captain's cabin. Then he went home to think things over. It now emerged, however, that Descartes was hesitating. He wasn't sure that this was something he wanted at all. And there was something else. The ship had given him a funny feeling, like as if it was a ship of death. It was, too, because apart from the captain and a few others, the crewmen were more dead than living.
there were more encouraging letters. Every day Descartes took his constitutional down to the port, as was his wont, and every day he saw the Vasa looking shipshape and ready to sail, with her shrouds neatly gathered at the masts, but somehow he couldn't repress a shudder. The letters finally had their effect. Chanu, who knew that a Swedish naval vessel had docked in Amsterdam, he just didn't know which one, wrote a final eloquent appeal to the philosopher to set sail for Stockholm, in which he pulled out all the stops. Growth of science under an enlightened young monarch, influence of France in the north of Europe, and a new lease of life for the philosopher himself as head of a new academy where scholars would hang on his every word. Descartes let it be known to Hansen and Gjertsen that he'd go on board the next day and they could set sail for Stockholm then. He did go on board, hesitating to the last, as if he was boarding Charon's boat to cross the sticks to the underworld. The weighed anchor and sailed out on the night tide into the North Sea. Less than a week at sea and they were in sight of Stockholm Harbour. But the captain waited until after dark to manoeuvre his way in. He anchored out in the harbour too, exactly over the spot where he had sunk twenty years before. He sent the philosopher ashore in the ship's boat. The crewmen knocked at the gate of Treykroner. and Descartes was admitted and taken to the Queen. The sailors returned to their boat, rowed back to the Vasa, and boat, seamen, ship and crew all vanished. The philosopher was received with all honour by the Queen and court, although the Swedish scholars were somewhat jealous at his arrival. The next morning, Queen and philosopher were sitting opposite one another across a table in a spacious study at the Tre Kroner castle. Descartes began by saying, Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. His whole philosophy, he told her, was built on the bedrock of this statement that could not be denied, even if one was unsure of everything else. For if you knew yourself to be thinking, you could hardly deny the fact of your own existence. He started giving her these philosophical lessons in the early morning, and they discussed the plans for an academy. In the course of that winter, Pierre Chanu fell ill with a fever, and Descartes, who was staying at his house not far from the Tre Kroner, took part in looking after him and nursing him back to health. The trouble was that Descartes then succumbed to the fever himself. He hung on as best he could, refusing treatment from the Queen's court physician who wanted to bleed him. And then he shocked everyone be dying. Ambassador Chanu and Christina both felt terrible. Yet they had to set about arranging his burial. They decided to bury him in the graveyard at Nord Malmö, which for the Swedish Lutherans was unconsecrated ground. Catholicism was forbidden in Sweden, and as a Catholic, Descartes was not entitled to a regular burial. So they decided to put him out there. The loss of Descartes had a crushing effect on Christina. She had regarded him as her window on the wide world of Europe, and now he was dead. What hope was there for her? Chanu knew what she was thinking and did his best to invite other French men of science to Stockholm. But Christina had lost all interest in her position as head of state. She desperately wanted out of Stockholm, and she just longed to travel and see the world. A year after her chosen teacher Descartes died on her, she was in two minds whether to give up the crown or not. In his old house in Stockholm, the aged Hansen knew about this. One night, 
Devasa rose and put a boat ashore to advise her. Again there was the midnight knock on the gate of Trey Croner. Hansen and Geardson and their party told Christina that they would support her in leaving the kingdom. But they said she would have to think of abdicating and giving someone else in the royal family a crack at it. It was the only responsible thing to do. She wouldn't be able to come back whenever it suited her. So they urged her to avoid precipitation in the matter, but to lay her plans carefully. On the strength of that, she bided her time for a couple of years, finding a suitable successor. In 1654, she was ready to make her move. One night, the Vassar crew came ashore and planned her departure with her. The next day, she formally abdicated. When asked about her own plans for the future, she replied with a half-line from the Aeneid that Monsieur Descartes had several times quoted to her when he was alive. Fata via minveniant. The fates will find a way. Now, the following night, no one saw her leave the royal palace, but in the morning it became known that she was gone from Stockholm. People said that she had left the Trey Kroner, accompanied by a few servants, and dressed as a young man in black. It seems it was often her choice to dress this way, though not in public. The Vasa had surfaced, put a boat ashore, and she had boarded the phantom ship. Hansen and his men weighed anchor and set sail again for the North Sea. This time they sailed up the Elbe and put her ashore in Hamburg. She continued her travels incognito as a studious young gentleman going to Amsterdam and Brussels. Having let her off there, the ship returned to Sweden at night and before dawn it was back on the bottom of Stockholm Harbour. In the year 1666, stories reached France that the cemetery at Nord Malmé was becoming dilapidated. So, well-wishers of Descartes started a campaign to get his body repatriated and successfully enlisted the support of the young king, Louis XIV. The then ambassador in Stockholm, Hugues de Terlon, was instructed to petition Christina's successor, Charles XII, to let them recover the body and ship it to France. The king consented, adding that they should do it discreetly. Hugues de Terlon was due to be replaced as ambassador, and his last official act, along with his successor, Simon Arnaud de Pompin, who had just arrived in Stockholm, was to go to Nord Malmé and exhume the body. They were accompanied by Captain Isaac Klanström, the captain of the Royal Guard, and a detachment of his men. It was a terrible, wild, windy night. They went there under cover of darkness to avoid attracting attention. By lamplight, they found the grave, already covered in rubble, and they dug up the body. It was decomposed, of course. There was only the skeleton and the grinning skull of the philosopher in a pale shroud. Terlon was very much afraid of the body being interfered with by grisly souvenir hunters. This must have occurred to him, as he wanted to take a relic himself of the great man, like he would the relic of a saint. He had the body laid in a special metal coffin inside a wooden one. Then they laid the bones in this double coffin they had brought, but not before Ternon had taken the right index finger from the skeleton, thinking it would be a fine relic from the hand that wrote the philosopher's immortal works. Then, escorted by Plans de Rome and his men, 
he took the coffin in a carriage to the ambassador's residence, where Planstrom was left to guard it. Now this Planstrom was a disreputable young rascal who was oppressed by gambling debts he couldn't pay. Seeing Terlon take the finger from the skeleton had given him a frightful idea, and despair brought it to fruition. He resolved to steal the skull from the body and sell it on the black market, expecting to get a good price for this grisly relic of a great foreign visitor. When he was left alone with the coffin, he opened its two lids and after a slight effort, wrenched the skull from the rotten corpse. Yet now he feared detection, if and when the body was inspected. He must find a skull to replace this one. One skull looked very like another. Where would he find one? Surely in the grave of the unbelievers at North Malmé. Spiriting away the skull of Descartes to his own quarters under his cloak, he retraced his steps to the graveyard that very night and dug up another body of some hapless infidel or foreigner. Breaking open the rotten wood of the coffin, he seized the skull, tore it from the skeletal remains and reburied body and coffin hurriedly. Then he stole away with the skull again under his cloak and brought it to the French ambassador's residence. There he opened the coffin again and put his find on the headless body of the dead philosopher. It seemed to fit. The stranger's skull seemed to grin sardonically at the neatness of the deception. So more than satisfied with his impious work, young Planstrom resealed the coffin. No one else must get any relics from the great philosopher. A few days later, the coffin was taken to the gate of Tre Kroner, where a boat was waiting. The taciturn seamen loaded it on board and rowed out into the harbour and disappeared from sight in the mists. These were Hansen's men. Hansen himself had died, but he was still active in state affairs and the Vasa had got the job of taking the philosopher's remains to, to Copenhagen where they were taken in charge by French officials and transported overland to Paris. The coffin was never opened from the time it left Stockholm until it reached French territory, when it was inspected by French customs men and certified as a full skeleton, the mortal remains of the great philosopher. Free of his duties to the French ambassador, Young Planstrom set about making good his plan. He let it be known to black market circles he knew that the skull of Descartes was for sale and he soon disposed of it for a tidy sum. He was able to pay various debts of honour to fellow officers and a large amount that was owned to the proprietor of a certain shady casino he frequented. In the end, he had some left over. Mightily pleased with himself, he walked with a light step back to Trey Croner Castle. It was a misty night. By the waterfront, he was jumped by a gang of sailors and bundled into a waiting ship's boat. They rowed him out into Stockholm Harbour. It seemed he was being shanghaied aboard some ship. Where are we going? he demanded to know of the bosun. To the Vasa was all the ghastly crew would say. This, of course, was impossible. The Vasa had sunk many years before and had never been raised. Yet now they rowed him out to the side of a stately galleon and he was forced aboard at Cutlass Point. Once on deck, they took him to the bridge where a man who must be the captain was standing. Why am I here? asked Planstrom. What do you mean by this outrage on an officer of his majesty? Someone wants to see you, said the captain ominously. He wants to give back to you what you gave him. Come with me. Planstrom, guarded by sailors, followed the captain to the captain's cabin. 
In the middle of the room was a table, and on this table was a coffin. Planström went to look at it. He paled. He knew this coffin. It was the coffin of Descartes. At a word from Hansen, the sailors went and opened the coffin, first the wooden lid, and then the iron one below it. Inside was the skeleton and skull as he had left it. There was a silence. Then the skeleton stirred and sat up. With the effort, the skull fell from its shoulders. Planstrom yelled in terror <coughs> and fled out of the cabin. No one stopped him. Out on deck, all was dark. He saw no one there. He walked around helplessly, seeking a means of escape. A boat, perhaps. There was none. All he heard was the surge of the sea all around him. Then ahead of him on the deck, he saw a figure approaching. It was the skeleton, now with the skull under its arm. He fled. The thing pursued him all the way along the deck from stem to stern. Then having nowhere to flee, he turned terrified at bay. The skeleton paused near him. Then it picked up the skull in a bony right hand, which he noticed was missing an index finger. With prodigious strength, it hurled the skull at Planström. The missile struck him on the forehead and he fell in a swoon. And suddenly he saw other sailors on the deck. And he heard the voice of the captain saying, All hands prepare! Going down! Going down! The last thing he remembered was the deck of the ship being engulfed by surging waters on every side. There was another story about the Vasa much later in Swedish history. After the French Revolution, King Gustav III had seized absolute power in Sweden by a kind of coup d'etat. There was no armed opposition, but his enemies were biding their time. Gustav did not take them seriously, however. He was even warned by a famous fortune teller and medium in Stockholm, Madame Arvidsson, that he was fated to lose his life. He had gone to see her, accompanied by a count who was a friend of his. They were both disguised, so she didn't recognise the king. Telling his fortune, she revealed that on his return home, he would meet a masked man with a sword, who meant him no good, and in fact was seeking his life. As the two men walked back to the royal palace, Gustav remarked that they hadn't met the figure of ill omen Madame Arvidsson had described. The Count laughed and urged the King to put it out of his head. But once in the Royal Palace again, going up the stairs, they met a man wearing a sword who was coming down. It turned out afterwards to be the chief of the conspirators plotting to assassinate him. Yet Gustav laughed this off too and he made preparations for a masked ball to be held at the newly built opera house, to which friend and foe alike would be invited. In the meantime, Madame Arvidsson had realised in a flash of inspiration who the mysterious client had been. It was the king, and he really was in danger. Being not only a fortune teller, but a medium skilled in contacting the spirits of the dead, she knew about the Vasa, and its ghostly captain and crew, and she got in touch with them. One night thereafter, the ship surfaced, and the boat came ashore, with Hansen, Gyrdsen, and the rest. They were all long dead. But they went to see the king, and when they were alone with him in a meeting room, they told him not to go to the masked ball. He'd be assassinated. But he wouldn't take this message from beyond the grave seriously either. Despairing of their mission, they went back to the boat, 
and the Vasa sank beneath the waves, apparently for good. On the night of the masked ball, Gustav appeared in the theatre, in a box near the stage, and said that if anybody wanted to shoot him, they had their best chance there. But nothing happened. Then he went into the ballroom and mingled with the guests. The conspirators were among the crowd of masked revellers. One of the conspirators, who had drawn the lot to take the king's life, got in a pistol shot at him. But that was all. Gustav was wounded, but not seriously, it seemed. Yet the wound turned septic, and in a few days he died. And the Vasa appeared no more above the waters to advise, console, and warn the monarchs of Sweden. After Descartes' body had been exhumed and repatriated in the year 1666, it was buried in the church of Saint-Germain-des-Prés in Paris. In 1819, after the upheavals of the revolution and Napoleon's despotic rule, the newly reformed Academy of Sciences, presided over by the great Cuvier, decided to give the body of Descartes a fitting resting place at last. The remains had been removed from the church of Saint-Germain-des-Prés for safekeeping during the darkest days of the revolution, when churches were being ransacked and vandalised. This time, a committee of academicians gathered and exhumed the coffin, opening the two lids to see what state the remains of the illustrious tinker were in. They were surprised to find a fragile skeleton, but no skull on it. What had happened to the skull? One of the scholars in attendance was a Swedish academician named Bezelius. He suspected that the skull might have been stolen before the body ever left Sweden. On returning to his own country, he began to investigate, and to his surprise, he read a notice that the skull of Descartes was part of an estate which was to be sold. He secured this skull himself for a trifling sum. He noticed with mounting excitement that the forehead of the skull was written on in ink, including a Latin epigram on Descartes and his skull, and a list of the names of all the owners through whose hands it had passed in the space of a century and a half. Since the strange disappearance of its original possessor, Planström, the skull had clearly had many owners. Bezelius resolved to send the skull to Gouvier and the Paris Academy. He arranged to send it on board a ship, leaving Stockholm for Holland and France. The night before he sent it, Bezelius had a strange dream. He was down by the Trekroner castle with the skull in a box under his arm, looking for a ship he could send it on to France. A ship's boat came inshore out of the mist, and a voice hailed him. Dr. Bezelius, it said, come with us. Will and Hans helped him down into the boat, and the sailors rowed him out into Stockholm Harbour. Through the mists, he saw a strange old-fashioned sailing ship come into view. He was helped onto the deck with his precious cargo and taken to the bridge, where the captain was waiting. The captain eyed the box containing the skull. You have it, he said. We have been waiting a long time for it. Come with me. The captain led Bezelius to the captain's cabin. Inside, Bezelius saw a wooden table with something laid out there that he soon recognised as a coffin. The captain opened one lid and then a metal lid underneath it. Bezelius stared. He saw a human skeleton, but it was headless. There was no skull. He looked at the captain. The captain nodded. You see that we have been waiting all this time, he said. But time does not matter to us. We sail through time, backwards and forwards, and we quit time, down in the depths, and return to time, 
when we are needed. Now give our passenger what is his at last. At this point, Bezalius woke up. The dream seemed vivid enough. All the more so when he went down to the Trey Kroner wharf the following evening after dark to consign his precious box to the ship that was taking it to France, as had been arranged. A boat appeared through the mists, rowed by sailors. He heard a voice calling, Dr. Bezalius! And hands reached out for the box. Bezalius gave it to them without a word, for he had seen that it was the same boat he had boarded in his dream. This time he did not board. The boat rode away in the darkness and was seen no more. The skull duly arrived by sea and land in Paris and was received with great curiosity by Cuvier and his academicians who were soon convinced that this was indeed the skull of Descartes. It matched portraits of him very well. It was even examined by the celebrated Dr. Gall, the inventor of phrenology, who pronounced it to be authentic in view of the bumps on it indicating a great intellect. It is still to be seen in a Paris museum to this day. In 1961, when the Swedes had forgotten all of these stories, the government decided they'd raise the vase from the seabed and put the whole thing in a specially built museum in Stockholm. So just after it had been installed there, my father went to see it, and he brought me back a book about it, which I as a chiseler loved. I often looked at the picture of the Vasa in all its glory, and dreamed of taking a voyage on her, back in olden times. I never forgot the Vasa. Well, almost. One night after my father was long gone, I was drinking at a bar down on the Dublin docks. I'd been looking at the Tall Ships Festival, for there were tall ships in port from all over. I got talking to a sailor. He said he was off a Swedish ship. His name was Hansen. An old sailing ship it was, he said, just like in the old days. He said if I came down to the port, he'd give me a tour of it. So off we went. At the quays, there was a skiff waiting. We got in, and it took off out into Dublin Bay. There was low mist over the water, and we seemed to be gone for a long time, with the sailors working doors, and not a word over them. Eventually, an old-fashioned sailing ship hove in sight up ahead of us, with bright lanterns to show the masts, the rigging and the deck. We climbed up on board. I looked around on the deck at the crowd of fellows that were waiting to meet us. I seemed to recognise some of them. One was a feminine young man dressed in black. Another was an older man with a beard, also dressed in black, with a white rough collar around his neck. Finally, I saw my father. He gave me the fright of my life. Da, what are you doing here? says I. Does this mean I'm on a ghost ship? He laughed as he looked out to sea. When the museum closes and every law-abiding citizen has gone to bed, we open the doors, slide down the slipway and into the water, and we go for a spin over the harbour and down the Baltic, past Copenhagen to the Kattegat and the Skagerrak. We do of rare old times. But what are you doing on the Vasa? I asked. When I went to Sweden, though none of you realised it, I had the time of my life. When I came home, I talked about it for a year or more. Don't I remember it well, says I. Well, he said with a sigh, afterwards it faded from me memory. But at the end, and me and the old nursing home, I started to think about it again. And it was all before me, as vivid as when I went there in the year 1964. So when I left me earthly mansion, I elected a berth with the ghostly crew of the Vasa, back in old Stockholm. Piche, says I, I wouldn't put it past you. Do you know that? He laughed again and looked up into the night sky. Then he turned and looked at me. 
I always enjoy being back in old Dublin for a while, he said. Now that's done. We're about to weigh anchor again and sail for a few hours more. We just have to be back be dawn. Will you come? Indeed I will, says I. Already I could hear the roar of orders in Swedish from Captain Hansen and Lieutenant Gjertsen, and the men were busy shaking out the sails and raising the anchor. We were sailing out into the Irish Sea. I'd been shanghaied aboard. We stood at the bow of the Vasa, looking out to sea. I turned to me father. Can this really be happening? I asked. Or am I only dreaming it? Are you really here? Am I really here? The bearded older man I had seen was standing beside us now. He told me, Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. And he nodded sagely. Where are we going though? I asked. We seem to have no course set in all the wide seas. How will we ever get anywhere? How will we ever get home? Now the young man dressed all in black drew near us and said in a woman's voice, Vata viam invenient. The fates will find the way and smiled triumphantly. You have been listening to Shanghai Aboard the Vasa by Torloch Con Me from 13 Tales Told by a Dubliner. If you've enjoyed the story, don't forget to like, subscribe, share and comment. And so, until next time.